All right, you all see the screen? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so this will be my only slide. The rest will be uh, interactive real time. First part, I'll be just demonstrating a little bit of what uh, I've been doing in terms of 3D visualization and a little introduction into the software I use, which is called Parabu. So just show what it is, where, how you get it. And uh, the second part, uh, I'll still be running things, but you are very welcome and encouraged to follow me and do the same thing. And for that, you would need Paraview, and you would need another thing, which, are, which is called PV Atmos. And I'll go through that. Um, so the two, the link to Paraview is down there, paraview.org, and then download if you like to install it. Um, there should be no installation required, even on Linux. It should just be binaries. For me, it's always worked. Um, for Linux, Windows, Mac, just download it, and it runs usually. And then for the other package, PV Atmos, uh, there's the git command or the pip command, but I'll go through that time. So PowerView, what is it? Um, show you the website in the beginning. PowerView.org, it's a product that's being developed by a company. So they actually make money with it, even though the product, um, the uh, software itself is completely free. Um, it's not a, there's no pro version for which you have to pay or anything. You get the full version. It's Python based and you can do everything for free, no problem. The way they make money is by doing counseling and things. So if bigger centers want to actually do more than just have single users, if they want to actually build their own software on top of it or stuff like that, then they get paid for doing that. That's how the company I makes you money. You consulting, not counseling. Consul uh, sorry, yes, thank you, consulting. So there's one of my mistakes for eternity. Um, consulting, that's how they make money. Um, and also via uh, American National Science Foundation uh, funding. That's the other way. That's how it's being uh, set up. So that's got a big advantage for us as users. It means it's not just some random guy who just suddenly maybe decides to stop the whole thing um, and then you're just left in limbo. But this is actually here. This is going to stick around. This is going to be developed further and further and further and it's going to be around and there's a big user basis, which is good. Okay, and then if you like to go and download it, you can go here on the download link and it should automatically detect what you want and just choose one of those versions. Okay, so from there, I, of course, have already downloaded this. All right. Um, so I'll start this up. And here we go. So this is the interface. I'll make this a little bigger. And now again, in terms of hardware, I'm running this on a five-year-old um, MacBook Air. No graphics card whatsoever, just a rather slow CPU and everything, but it still works. So again, you, nobody should have trouble running it. It's really very nicely made. If you have a graphics card, it will use it. If you don't, it will not complain and just use your CPU, no trouble. Okay. so. Interface, I think I'll do a learning by doing more or less. Just one thing, this gray area here is where your 3D stuff will appear, as you see the little axis spinning around. So I'll just go ahead and load in a this is so exciting. file. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, NetCDF file, this, is, this comes out of GFS forecast. This is one of the files I use for my um, forecasts on my website. Um, if you click OK, Paraview tries to find out on its own what kind of file this is and what kind of standards might apply to it and things. And it says it's a NetCDF and it's got four different versions of NetCDF. And what we mostly need is the CF conventions. So the climate, 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 forecast, climate, whatever the F is. Maybe. Conventions. 
click OK, and you have your file here in what is called a pipeline browser. You don't see anything because it hasn't done anything. So one thing with PowerView is it's made for analyzing big data sets, which might severely slow down your computer. And so it doesn't do things before you tell it to. And that's why on here on the properties, there's always the apply button. So it won't do anything before you hit apply. Uh, but I go ahead and click apply. And what you see is that it found out that there's a longitude and a latitude in the file. So it thinks that this is probably a spherical coordinate system. And if you choose to do so, it actually makes a sphere for you. So this is 2D data. This is only lat long um, surface data, uh, but it can create a sphere for you if you like. Now, once you have this, there's also an information pane, which panel, which tells you what type of grid it is. All of this is a little uh, technical. You probably don't need it. What might be interesting to know is how much memory it uses that particular file. And then here are, is the data that you have in the file. And it also tells you some data range, which might always be interesting. So in this case, we have precipitation, surface temperature, and Z is actually my topography. And I'll come to that right away. And then it tells you how many grid points there are in each direction, in each dimension, and the range. And the range now is minus 1 to 1 because it's a sphere with radius 1. So that's what the range is. And now, the most important thing is up here, you can choose the variable you want to visualize. So I choose my topography, and I get my sphere. Immediately, I recognize this sphere as planet Earth, um, this topography. And this is how, so already you have from some 2D data, immediately you have something 3D. Um, then I'd like to add another variable. Let's say I want to do precipitation. And I could just do this, just switch to precip, and it'll show me precipitation. But now I'd like to have the map and precipitation. And the problem is that precipitation is zero in most places, or at least very low at most places. And I'm not really interested in this, and it would just hide everything else. So there are which, which they call filters. Filters are all the objects you can do things with. And if you have an alphabetical order of all the possible ones, it's a very long list. Everything that's grayed out means for this particular data, it doesn't apply. So you can't use it. So PowerView already knows what it can actually apply to this data. And it, lets you not, it doesn't let you select anything that doesn't work. You can do lots of things, lots of things. And they, the same filters are also uh, in little sections, like you can do some data analysis. Um, you can do uh, temporal analysis, or you can interpolate in time, um, and all that kind of stuff. Or if you already know what you do, you can click search, and I want a threshold, enter, and then it adds a little threshold to my data. So in the pipeline browser, this always tells you where you are. And PowerView does something which is called uh, non-destructive um, analysis which means the file itself will not be changed or anything. It just takes the file, and then you can do stuff with it. And that will just make the pipeline longer and longer as you go down and do stuff. But you can always come back. It will not, we will never destroy data. So if you, what we'll do later is cut out some region. And if you then still want something global, the global stuff will still be there, even though you've cut out the region. But I'll come to that later. I'll show it to you. So let's for the moment do a threshold precip. I only want to do 0.1 millimeters per hour. So I just do a minimum in precip, apply, and that shows me my precip now on the sphere. And everything that's below 0.1 millimeters is gone. Um, and I want to color this by precip. It does that on its own. Actually, I want to color this by the other precip. Um, so there's two different symbols here. One is it's a cell data, and the other one means it's point data. Most things work with point data, but many files have cell data. But PowerView will convert it for you. For instance, for the threshold, it does a threshold on every grid point in your data. 
Thus, it has to convert your cell data into point data, and that's why now we have suddenly a point precip and a cell precip. But the point is the one that the threshold works on, and so this is the one we want. Um, and we also want our Earth back, so we can just click on this little icon here. If the eye is closed, it means we don't see it. If the eye is open, it means we see it. And then I want here, not precip, but I want this as to show my little earth. And here we go. So we've got two fields on top of each other now um, with two filters. Now we can choose different color schemes. And whatever is selected, there's here, this is the color scheme button. And it shows you your color scheme. And then there's this little heart there, the little folder with the heart. That means that's your choices of color schemes. There's a lot of them. There's all the, um, the color brewer schemes are there. Most of the MATLAB schemes are there. There's ERDC are there. There's lots of them and you can even create your own and save it. And that's what I did here. I call this Topo Gold because it makes earth just look so nice and shiny. <laughs> then you might also want to have a different value range. And for that, you have these range arrows and you can just color it by a different value range. And I want to do it 640 to 8,000. That's just how I happened to define my color scheme because now the gold is really zero and we have all the gray stuffish oceans because who cares about oceans, right? That's true. Yeah. Right. And we can do the same thing with precip. We can choose a different one. A color scheme here, I like the boo poo for precip. You can simply invert it with this button. And um, another nice thing to do is just check the range here. Yeah, change zero to let's make it 10, that we see something, right. Another nice thing is this, this plot here. This shows you the opacity you're choosing. So zero here means it's completely transparent. One means it's completely opaque. But this is mostly used for volume rendering. But here we're not doing re volume rendering, but you can enable the opacity with this little click here for surfaces. And now almost everything is gone, except that little hurricane here, um, because opacity is zero at, at the minimum. It just by default does a linear. But you can click anywhere to add a point. You can double click it and you can change the form in any way you like. Uh, and you can also delete it again. That's a great way to manipulate your data. Yeah, exactly. So you can emit it. No, you, you can manipulate the data, but you can also zoom in on the important parts, right? So if I reduce this, okay. So what did I do? I did something I shouldn't have done. Yeah, okay, let's go back. Right, and what I want is I want it to be zero at point zero and I want it to be a one at one. That's just a personal thing I like. And then here I, I did something I shouldn't, shouldn't have done. Yep, so make it linear. All right, now we've got only the Large train, so this is still the hurricane over last. So this, by the way, is data from 10 a.m. this morning. So this is almost right now. We have a little hurricane over Korea. We have the remnants of the hurricane over Japan. We have a new hurricane in here in the Pacific. I have some other nice stuff going on in Tasman Sea here. And already you can explore data, and this is very simple, right? This is just two variables, 2D variables, which you can explore in three dimensions. Then, um, what should I do next? Yes, pipeline. I'll say a few more words about this pipeline and try and illustrate this. Um, so one thing we can do is like, oh, I, I don't want to look at a whole earth. I just want to cut out something. So you have this little filter. So these are like just the filters that most people use most of the time, but they're all also up here in filters. So one is called clip. So I can either choose it here, or I could have gone to filters, search, and clip, and it would have done the same thing. But I just, this is easier. And so a clip adds a plane, and the red plane is where I clip my, all of my data off. 
and in origin here I can decide where exactly that should be, what the normal should be, or I can do this with my mouse, say, okay, I want to clip it off like this, so cool. and hit apply, and now what happens? Does anybody have an idea what happens to Earth if I now click apply? Will Earth be cut into two? And of course the answer is no, it will not. And the reason is the pipeline. So what has happened? If we remove this plane, what happened is that on this side of the globe, we have precipitation. On the other side of the globe, there's no precipitation. So that one got cut in half, but the Earth didn't get cut in half. And the reason is the pipeline. So this is a direct connection. First, the complete data. Then the first filter does a threshold on precipitation. The next filter filters that threshold on precipitation even further and cuts off half of the globe. So there's only half of the globe in precipitation, but the very first one, which is upstream in the pipeline, is still there in its entirety. So if I want to cut the whole thing, I actually have to apply the clip. I can here change the input with a right click. I can apply it to here. And now I'm rearranging. And now if I show this in Z, now I only have half the Earth from the clip because the clip now connects directly to my data. However, if I want to show the, the precip again, then the precip will be on the whole, whole Earth now because there's no clip applied to this threshold. And so these little lines are really important. The order matters in what you do things. So often if you want to zoom in on something, you actually have to reverse engineer and go from the big picture slowly to the smaller things, whatever you want to look at. And you have to construct your pipeline with this. So visualizing in that way requires knowing what you want to do. It requires knowing where you want to go and then you can start building your pipeline. So now if I want really, I only want half the globe, what I have to do is to also connect the threshold to the clip because then I first clip the data and then I do the threshold and visualize my precip. And now my precip is there in the half globe where we expected it in the beginning. So here again, if I set up and said, I only want to see half the globe and produce my data, then I would have known about that when constructing a pipeline and put in the clip right away after the data. But in this example, I didn't. So I thought later I might maybe, um, maybe concentrate on you only on one hemisphere and then I added the clip so I have to rearrange everything. So that's the pipeline. It's import the order matters here. And as to the clip, there's only other things. There's all, there's quite, uh, this was a plane. You can also do other things like a sphere, which are kind of like. So now I'm clipping out a sphere. So let's get just Australia out. All right, hit apply, and now we've only cut Australia out of the globe. So we can do stuff like that. So this would be one way of having a projection, which is not even a projection, but you have only, you have only Australia on your map, but you don't need to apply any projection because you have actually used the, spher the, the spherical geometry of, of your land. Okay, um, then this can be a long process to build your pipeline and to really filter out to where you want to get, and it, especially if you just explore and try to find things which are worth looking at. And so you don't want to have to do this every time. And for that, what you can do is file, save state, and you can save it either as a state file or as a Python file. Now, if I choose Python file, and I just call this um, GFS state, and then it asks me, this is just, if I do it as Python, it asks me whether I want just the way it is now, or whether I want just really save everything I've ever done. Um, click OK. And so what I can do now 
is so this is a disconnect. This means I completely lose everything I've done before. I start as if I've just started the program again. Everything's empty. It completely restarts. And now I do load state. Take my Python file. And here is my state, exactly the same as it was before. So I don't have to redo everything again. Um, Another thing is, so what I said is the state file. Um, so I do the state file, gfs state as a state file. And then I reinitialize just to see what happens. The advantage of this, log state, if I take the state file, it will ask me which data files I want to use. So this means if I want to redo the same thing, but with a different file, I can just load the state file and choose a different file. In my case, I don't have another file, so I just do this again. And then again, it'll create your state. And what you can do is once you've loaded it and then you've got a second file you want to compare to, you can just load exact the same state again and choose a different file and go ahead. And you'll have the same thing twice but with two different files. So that's the advantage of the state file versus the Python script. Um, another good thing is that you can, I'll, I'll use this right away afterwards. So there's on the view, there's a Python shell. So it comes packaged with its own Python. So you won't know about Anaconda environments or anything uh, inside this shell. However, it does know about all the packages you installed via PIP or anything. Um, and you can, actually, you can program the whole thing. So all of what I've done here, everything you do with your mouse and click and everything, you can all do all of this with a script. And in order to know what actually the commands are and everything, um, you can do this. There's a tools.trace. And when you click, and most of the time this is just fine the default, this records everything you do as Python script. So it's now not, if I go. It's not like moving around, it's every actual active. Every actual act, yeah. So rotating, even rotating around actually because it will, I'll, I'll show you right away afterwards. So if now I want to do, I have this threshold uh, and I want to do a second threshold, I want high precip but also high temperature for instance. Um, I only want, only want the highest temperatures. There you go. Okay. Um, and then I go tools, stop trace. And it'll show me what I've just done as a Python script. And it even comments your code for it you. It even comments your code for you. Incredible. Yeah. And so you've got down here, you've got, this is all the visualization thing. So just showing the axis, opacity transfer function. There must be a threshold. Here you go. So that's all I do. Threshold on precip. That's the first threshold. And then I change that to surface temperature. I change the threshold range. And then I render it. And so, to learn how to code this whole thing in Python uh, is simply to do it with your mouse and you know interactively and then look at the script and that'll tell you what, what to do. And with time, you start really getting into it. Or just use look at the state file, which is a Python file as well. So it's also commented by the way. So if we do a cat on this file, so I've got this, GFS state file. So again, this is a Python file which is commented, so it tells you what it does. And you can learn or just copy paste into your own script if you like, without even knowing what it does. As long as you know which sections do what you want, just copy paste it into your script. And you'll have a working script. Which, by the way, the scripts, you can submit them to NCI uh, on the normal compute nodes and they'll just run. They don't need a display to run. 
I've done that with some of my uh, 360 degree movies. Um, I just couldn't do this on my computer, so I submitted to NCI and it works just fine. Okay. That. Which reminds me, I want to start with a movie. So I'll show you a little movie now first, or as next, of what kinds of thing. I've just done this little trailer a few years back. And it's been a lot of work, so I want to show you as much as I can. Um, if I plug this in, do you hear the, the sound? I'll try. Let's see. The microphone's right there, so it probably would work with that as well. Ah, yeah, OK. Do you still hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, cool. All right. So, yeah, I'll do it with this. That's safer. Yeah, you can you can you can buy tickets to me directly for the movie, and maybe one day you'll see it. Um, okay. Yes, three D data. I was showing you two D data, how to convert um, one into the other. Oh, why did everything disappear? Okay, doesn't matter. Seems like my terminal quit. Um, Okay, because I want to show you 3D stuff. So, so far, what we've seen is that Paraview actually knows if it's spherical data. Um, and so I'll, I'll actually load this state. That's a good thing I, I saved that state. Um, except that I didn't. What happened? Okay. Yeah, good, thanks. Okay, here we go. I'll load the state as is. Okay. And I don't need the threshold. I just want to see the sphere. Here we go. Okay, so we're back at our sphere. Now, so this is just, this doesn't have a depth, right? So this just computes, creates an earth for my 2D data. So what happens if I have 3D stuff? Um, and of course I have that here. So I have one file, again, CF conventions, and the same thing up here. It sees that there's lawn and lat, so it thinks that it's spherical. However, the third dimension now is pressure. And we see how it deals with pressure. So I'll just go ahead and say, yes, please apply. And what it does, if we zoom out, this is our little earth, right? And as we zoom out, this is where my 3D data is. So this is simply an outline of the data. Now this is a lot bigger than my sphere here, even though I've loaded it in exactly the same way. And what happened? Well, it just took pressure and thought this was the radius. So this line up here is at 1,000 for 1,000 hectopascals. This line here is at 100 uh, for 100 hectopascals. And the sphere down here, the radius is one. So they absolutely don't match. Um, and if I go ahead and do a contour, so my variable in here is, is cloud liquid uh, content. So if I do point 0.1 gram per kilogram, contour on it, apply. What it does is that it just takes a contour of the data. And these are my clouds on the pla same planet um as the one which is right here in the center 
So this clearly doesn't work. And the reason is that pressure is the wrong way and it's logarithmic with height. So a thousand should be at the surface whereas a zero should be out of space. So it's the wrong way around, it should be inverted. And it should also be, if we want to do height, it should also be in logarithmic scale. A power view doesn't do that just like that. And that's where the video you've just uh, seen, that's where that comes in. So this is my little, um, my little package. So I'll remove this. And you can get it simply with these commands. So I have them, um, I'll, I'll git clone HTTPS GitHub, it's all on GitHub. Com Euchre PV Atmos to PV Atmos. This will be one command, and I'll have I'll I'll show at the end, I'll show the slide again. So this is the command to get it. Or the other one is just pip install. But if you don't want to actually install it, you just want to try it first, that one would be the one you want. So git clone HTTPS GitHub dot com and pv atmos and i want to have it in a folder called pv atmos if we go ahead and download all of this it's uh, only a few script files and a few um, example files and so now i have a folder pv atmos with my python scripts and with some examples and so now i can go into the python shell Wait for this to load. Right, and now there's a nice little button in the Python script which says run script. So even though it's actually a terminal and thing, you don't even have to code in the terminal. You can just go and click run script. Um, and my newly downloaded PV Atmos, there's an example, so I'll show you the sphere first. Just double click it. Now the script asks me something, he said, please provide the path where pvatmos lives, because I haven't actually installed pvatmos, but I have just downloaded the folder, so I need to tell it where it is. And in my case, it's in that folder. And then it'll just run. Here we go. So this is again, one file, with pressure coordinates, with zonal wind and meridional wind, which is visualized on the sphere now here. In so it's initially pressure coordinates. These surfaces are one hectopascal, ten hectopascal, one hundred hectopascal, and then the surface. And it's the twenty-five meters per second wind surface. So you've got the stratospheric vortex, and down here you've got the jets, the jet stream in the uh, in the atmosphere. And so how do you do this? do this? There's a filter called calculator, which is this one up here, that little calculator item, and that's what this is. So I connected it, this to the file. And you can do a thing which is called coordinate resolve, and that means you can modify your coordinates with a, with a function. And here's the function. I hat is along x, j hat is along y, and k hat is along the vertical. I don't change anything in x and y, so it's just do i hat times chords x, which is my x coordinates, y hat times, uh, j hat times coordinates y, which is my y coordinates. But it, then in the vertical, I apply a log function and divide the pressure by a thousand to invert it and do a log and then that gives me so if we go into information of the file the initial file the pressure goes from minus a thousand to minus 0.1 so it even goes the wrong way and then after my little calculator it goes from zero to pi and so my radius now is one plus zero to pi all the way up here and it starts giving something which you can actually look at and explore and zoom in and have a look at it and then all the rest everything else you see here is just annotations so that's just those little spheres here 
um, the little notation that this is 10 hectopascal. There's also a John Doe somewhere. Yeah. So you can add your own name so that it's more difficult for people to just copy paste <laughs> the figure. Um, it's not like a watermark, a 3D watermark. Um, and so this is just a script. Uh, it just loads uh, and you've got this. How long did it take you to do that? Not that long. Not that long. Uh, the thing is, I read it and read it. These, um, you know, these functions here. I did the, read it them all the time, all the time. And so at one point, I just put that into uh, a Python package, and that's it. And now you can just call a function which is called load data and tell it if it's very cool or not, and it'll do it. Um, there's also a thing, a functionality. If, for instance, you always do this, oh, and then also, by the way, go to spherical coordinates. So this is the normal, the usual conversion to spherical coordinates with the cosine of long latitude and the sinus of longitude and everything. This makes it into spherical coordinates. So it's, if this is something you always do, you can select both of these filters, um, go to tools and create the custom filter. And you can call this, a uh, log pressure sphere. And then it sees what you've, what you've selected as filters. You can create inputs and outputs. Um, so you'll need the input and you'll need one output. And uh, you can do some customs. If you want to change something, you can change the function, for instance, if you want this to be exposed so that you can later change it. Finish. And now what you can do is go to filters, search, log pressure sphere. There it is. This is now a, fil a filter you can apply. Uh, yeah. There you go. Um, and it will do exactly those things. So now you've got that little sphere here. So if there's things you always do all the time and you don't want a Python script or anything, you can just create your custom filter, which does you, which does the work you're doing all the time. And this will be stored. So next time you fire up PowerView, that filter will still be there. However, if you up, update PowerView to a new version, it won't be there anymore. But I think there's an, there's an export and import function. Okay, so the next thing I haven't shown you yet is, um, Let's make this red again. Is that this file has a time dimension, which is down here in the information. And it, there's three time steps here, and PowerView sees it, and thanks to those CF convention, it knows this is time. So I should put this into the time dimension. And then you have a little player up here. And all you have to do to make a movie is hit play, and it will just go through the time steps. So here there are only three time steps, so it's very small, but I can. Loop it, and that's all you've got to do. That's your movie. That's your animation in 3D. And then, of course, you can go to File, Save Animation, and then you can either save it as frames or as movie file or whatever you like. And as soon as you've got time in your file, that's all you need. So that's how easy it is to make a movie. Um, you might not have time in your file, or you might not want to use that time. So there's another way. There's view, animation, view. And I'll remove this. Um, and this is if you've ever worked with a movie software like iMovie, where my, my trailer, trailer was made with. This is exactly the same. You have different rows with different things that happen during the movie. And you can choose whatever you want. And every each one of these filters, whatever you have in your pipeline, can be animated. And so if I just want to spin it around, just have a look around in 360, there's already a predefined function which is called orbit. And I add this. And it asks me what my camera center should be, and that should be 0, 0, 0. My normal should be 0, 0, 1 to look up. And that's good. And all I have to do now, now it'll circle around once in my time steps. But 
this is not very much simple visible so I can do a se sequence and let's say yeah 10 frames and it'll just interpolate it for you so now if I go through it it will rotate everything you see you see the rotation in here the little those little icons tell you how you're actually flying around the whole thing so now I'm flying around the camera and time advances at the same time. So there's a lot of things happening here with just a few keystrokes. So it's interpolating the two steps in 10 steps, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, so the time steps, they actually jump. So you can, there's a filter which is called time interpolator mm -hmm. to have your data on those same time steps. But what it is doing by default, what it is doing right now is if you go step by step, um, here, the camera moves, but the steps. Exactly, the camera moves, but the data doesn't doesn't move until we go to two of five o three. Here's the time, and at five o three, the data will change as well. Now, from here to there, you have a time step in the data, so it will perform it. Otherwise, it won't. Mm -hmm. But there's a filter uh, which does time interpolation, and in that case, it will actually do it. It will linearly interpolate between the two, or you can actually you can tell it not to linearly interpolate, but spline or whatever you like. Yeah. Okay. So this is Atmos. I'll show you um, an ocean example. Oh my, ocean stuff. Are you sure you want to continue? Yes, I want to remove all of this. And now I need my Python. Um, Python. Then Python shell again. Okay. So there's also an example with oceans. Some ocean data. It's uh, oxygen content in the oceans. And this time I decided to do flat earth, so not, not a sphere. So it'll be a little uh, box once it loads. That's one thing. So whenever there's this blue line around the, uh, the picture, that means it's, it's working. It doesn't always show you the, um, the wheel of death, um, but whenever it's blue around and you don't see anything, that means it's working. And two other really, really useful buttons are these guys here. So this one will focus on whatever you've selected right now. So if you go ahead and select one of these, um, one of these filters, it'll go there. So if I do this now, it'll go to one of the, um, one of the labels. If you select the other one, it will zoom such that you see all of your data. So whenever you get lost and stuff, you can just hit this and you will see everything. So here are our oceans with the ozone content in the oceans. Um, That's so cool. And you can go in and truly have a look inside. You can go in, you know, from the bottom of the ocean if you like. You can move around. Uh, yeah. So here we are on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and this is Australia down here. So we're, whoa, and now we're inside the data, right? And now I get completely lost, so I hit that little button again, and I'm out. So I see everything again. So now I can do some more animation. Let's do something more interesting. So let's go back to animation view. Can I have a quick yeah, question? Yeah, please. It's never rendering as you move, right? Yeah, it so that's... everything to start with. Is that right? Uh, no, actually, this is easy enough. I start the set. This actually does render. But if you have things that are too heavy, it will rasterize everything so that you still see where you are while navigating, but it'll wait until you release the mouse button and then it'll render it. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, because the render in the end is always 2D. I'm so just amazing how fast it is even for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, so it's really fast because the whole data here is in the RAM and then it just, it, yeah. yeah. I mean, they've, they've spent years to optimize these things. Okay, so let's do one another thing. Again, the camera, I want to fly into my data. So I can animate my camera. And this time I don't want an orbit, but I want to interpolate camera locations. And I add this. Okay. So now what I can do is 
I double click this and I can put in my camera position. So I'll just do three of them. Okay. One is at time zero, one is at time 0 0.5 in the middle. Because I tell him here that my start time is zero, my end time is one. All right. And then I go to this position and I can just say use current. I can put in numbers if I know the numbers of where I want to be, where I want to look at, and what my view output would be. I can put those in or I can just say use current. Okay. And then I go somewhere else. Let's go inside down here somewhere. Let's go here. Double click here. Position two, use current. And it changed the numbers. Okay. And then what do I want? Then I want to go up that way. Here we go. Position one, use current. There you go. Okay. And now if everything works, I can hit play and it'll go in and it'll go out again. Now I can make this more frames to interpolate more frames that we actually see what is happening. And now it'll just move in to wherever you told it to go. This goes to the second position at 0.5 and then it goes to the third position I defined just before. And it'll do all the position interpolation for you on the fly. It's so cool. Right, so all of this interactively. So that's a camera animation. I've done two of them, so let's do something new now. Well, like, what we can do is that, let's say I wanna look at um, cuts, north-south cuts of this. So I can do this by, let's do, okay, this is the ocean, very good. So let's do here do a clip, which is perfectly fine, apply. And what happens now, uh, yep, is that, oh, it clipped the wrong thing. Sorry, I, ah, and then I need to reposition because this is the, this is the pipeline again. Here we go. And if I now show, now I've clipped only this side. And I actually want just by, just like that, I want to do the other way. Apply. Okay. So now it, it leaves everything on the right of this, of this plane, but it cuts out everything on the left of the plane. And then I want to do the same thing with my oxygen. Um, so I can, here I can just apply it here for the moment. Check. Invert. And that's it. Okay, now I've also cut the oxygen on the same plane. And now I want to animate this. So I can hear the first clip is the clip one. And as I said, so clip one, it has properties which are up here, origin, normal. And I can animate anything in any of the, all of these filters. So here clip one, I, ch I choose origin of zero. That's my X position. I add that. And I want this to go from, I believe it's minus 270 to 90, I think is the data. Okay, so now if I go to the first frame, we'll be all the way up here. And if I go to the last frame, we're down there. So this is actually um, the wrong way around. So I wanna go, well, it doesn't matter. I'll just go this and invert this again. Here we go. So we just go the other way. And clip, I'll just do the same thing, the clip two. Origin, add, and put in the numbers, minus 270 to 90. Okay. And also the invert button. Here we go. And if I go to the first frame, so now, what it does is that with time, it'll just build up all of your data. So you can look at cross sections 
um, of your data like this in an animated way. But it's not just useful to create movies. It's also useful, you can actually use this, you can just with your mouse, you go somewhere else, you say, oh, I wanted to look at this cross section. And then you have a look at this cross section. You can zoom in, have a look at this cross section and then see, well, how does this go, you know, just a little further or just a little further. And you can use this to cut interactively, cut your data again, without having to actually plug in numbers and everything. Wow. And again, you can just hit exp export animation and it'll give you all of this as a movie. What is the resolution of this data that we're looking at? Oh, this is very, I, I coarsened that. Degrees. No, no, I coarsened that a lot just to make it possible as, a, as an example. So the, the initial file was high resolution, but this is only... Point two yeah, so there's how many number of cells, number of points. So there's 2,000 points for the entire, uh, for the entire ocean. No, this is actually the clip, but I'll have to see here. Sorry. There you go. So it's 100,000 points for the entire ocean, yeah. for the 3D ocean. So that's not much in each direction. So it sounds like it might be one degree. Is that right? Oh, no, one thing with the depth as well. Yeah, the depth oh, okay. as well. So, yeah, it's very low, but that's just because of I wanted this to be yep. an example. Right. And um, what else is interesting? Oh, one thing I haven't shown you at all is um, so I've shown you this where you can choose by what you want you'd like your thing to be colored by. Here, I only have one variable, but then there's also this. This is the kind of visualization. So you color by, uh, in this case, depth, and you make a surface, or you can make it a wireframe, and then your ocean is now a wireframe. In some cases, you know, this looks like this looks cool, but it's probably not very useful. Um, but in some cases, this is more useful. In other cases, you just want to see points, so you just have points, or you want to see the surface, but you still want to see where your grip points are. Uh, so you can have a surface with edges. And then you can also do volume, but volume, you always have to be careful. Volume eats a lot of... I just tried it. You just tried it? Yeah. So, yeah. So volume, if you have a graphics card, it's, it's good. So this is really one point where having a graphics card makes a big difference in this terms. So I can just try what happens. I'll just put in volume. And it even tells you now, this may take a while. So let's let's just go ahead and try it. And actually, no, it went quick because, okay. So here the problem is there's no depth to the whole thing. There is no volume. So it tries to volume render on single sheet of data. So this will just be not visible. Unfortunately, this is a bad example for uh, this kind of thing. Ah, but I could try the oxygen actually. So if I do here, if I want to visualize the oxygen, I might as, there we go, here we are. This is my oxygen, the full data set, and I do volume. Yes, please go ahead. There you go. And I have to remove my contour. Yeah, so here's the oxygen rendered as the full volume which looks kind of nice, but it's, all, it's very often very difficult to actually see something if you do volume rendering. If you do clouds, it's amazing. That's the thing you need to use. But for many other data sets, it doesn't really make sense to do uh, volume rendering. You know, it does look nice. But yeah, so this is the other one. So those two, like, those two choices um, are the important ones. And whatever's predefined here, that's what I use all the time. It, I almost never really go into the filters and go look for things. I really use this kind of thing here. Okay, and with that, I'll show another movie, which is not by myself, but by Kane Stone, who was a student at Melbourne, when I gave a um, visualization tutorial. And about two months later, he sent me this movie, and it's amazing. So I thought I'll show this as well. This is about the ozone hole. Oh, there's no more sound. There was sound once. Mm. 
because he actually composed the music himself and made music and made the sound for it. But unfortunately, for some reason, I don't have the sound. So this is one example where the time is in the file. So all you have to do is hit hit play in Paraview once you have the uh, the uh, contours. I guess so. Yes. Yeah. Adele, you should totally do this with your channels. <laughs> then we believe you. <laughs> Okay, so I've shown you this and maybe I know that one person at least tried to do some stuff at the same time. You can only learn this by doing it yourself. It is impossible to learn how to visualize by just sitting back and looking at the lecture. You have to do it yourself. That said, if you try it and you've got questions, Shoot me an email. And if you have questions right now, ask them now. Otherwise, I think the hour's over. So um, thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, question. Yes. Is it possible to say with like uh, one uh, view in a thank you in a what's, what's it called in a this in a, any like uh, big, uh, figure format like ah I mean. Oh yeah, so I was only talking about um, animations. You can do a file, it's called Save Screenshot. And you, I'll put it on the desktop. You can choose some file format. Um, okay. Screenshot. Can you do... And then you can choose, you can actually scale it up or down. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly, it doesn't have to be exactly what you see. You can scale it up and down, but here just do yes. And then you have it here as a figure. Is that what you meant? Or yeah, is... yeah, yeah. But there is a, I just I don't know where it's going, but there is a, um, a file type which has like vectors. Ah, a vector, yeah. vector format. Yeah. You can do vector format, but the problem is um, this techno technically doesn't work. You cannot, it will create a vector format, but inside will be a bitmap. Okay. Because it is, simply technically impossible to do this as vector format uh, because this is rendered and this is a 3D stuff rendered onto a 2D plane mm. so that we can see it mm -hmm. and that doesn't work as a vector format. Okay. Yeah. But a high resolution normal figure will do. Yeah, exactly. So I, I've, I've been using a PNG for my publications mm -hmm. so and that's fine. I'm posters and Anything. Yeah, yeah sure. it's good. Yeah. The good thing with PNGs is that you can make the background transparent so that, you know, bluish, greeny stuff, that'll be just transparent and you can put it on any background you like. Oh, yeah. So that's how Kane did this, right? So here you've got this, this like universe background and that's how you do it. You export the thing with a transparent background and then you put another picture beside, behind it. Yeah. Okay. Do you use this for, so you, you're writing a paper, do you, would you plot with matplotlib or would you actually use oh, yeah. Paraview to make oh, a plot? Oh, yeah, I should mention that. Anything 1 or 2D, don't use Paraview. Yeah, yeah it's completely, do what, do what Scott was, you know, X-Array yeah. or whatever, matplotlib, yes. Uh, this is completely over the top, will make you lose time, and in the end, it'll be uglier than okay. matplotlib. I mean, actually, in the background, Matloft is running on this. But um, no, if you, the only thing 2D is what I started off with. If, if you want to transform 2D into 3D, then use this. If you want to do just 2D plots, no, don't. Yeah. Anything else? It seems very time consuming. How much time do you? Yeah, so yeah, that's the reason why I, I wrote the package. Um, yeah. Because once you start doing always the same thing, yeah. it actually, you you start getting really quick. Um, so it's, it's fine, it's okay. Um, but I think the most time consuming part is if you just, 
if you're just loading a file and you think, give me something cool, the software won't know what's no, cool well, and just do I mean. it for you. That's and that's what, what, what I mean takes by time. Consuming yes. Is you're just going to be, oh, I can do this too. I can do this too. You can just yes. think infinite amounts of time. And yes. You can, you can spend infinite amounts of time. Yes. Yes. So the best is if you first think about what exactly you want to show and, and actually write it down or, or try to draw it. Many times I thought, ah, I was looking for this perfect thing, but it never actually worked. So I went back on a paper, drew it, and then I was like, oh, yeah, this is what it should be. And then it was done in 10 minutes. So, yeah, it helps. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Martin. That was really impressive. Okay, uh, thanks. I assume the recording works. Uh, it should be up later today so people can come and see it. On cool. YouTube.